more organizations attempt to change their fortunes by embracing innovation, they find that assessing risk, making intelligent investment decisions is fraught with difficulty. In this show, we're joined by Dan Toma, co-author of Innovation Accounting, who's helping leaders figure out how to build approaches to the discovery and validation of new ideas that can go onto the balance sheet. Hey folks, welcome to The Evolving Leader. I'm Scott Allender. And I'm John Gomes. How are you feeling today, Mr. Gomes? I'm feeling meta. No, I'm not really. <laughs> really not feeling meta. Uh, no, I'm feeling good, actually. I'm recovering from a bout of flu that I had last week. Um, it's not 100% out of me, but I'm, I'm glad to be alive uh, and feeling more of myself. How are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling glad that you're alive as well. Um, I was I was feeling quite frazzled about an hour ago. It was one of those mornings trying to get two girls out of the house when they're fighting over everything in, in the world, and I don't know why, but uh, maybe just the end of a long week. But I was able to find 10 minutes for some meditation mindfulness work, and I'm now feeling centered and ready and excited to jump in today. So let me set the table for our Evolving Leader Feast today. Our guest is Dan Toma. Dan is the founder of Outcome, which helps large organizations such as ING, Bayer, DNB, and others improve their innovation efforts. He is the co-author of the award-winning The Corporate Startup, and his latest book, Innovation Accounting, is a practical guide for measuring the performance of your innovation ecosystem. Dan, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thank you very much, guys, for having me. Dan, welcome to the show. Um, how are you feeling? Well, good. It's it's Friday, so uh, I should feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, s- since the, the Lean Startup was published over a decade ago, there's been a huge surge in large corporations trying to rethink their classic approach to R&D and product development and innovation, generally with quite mixed results. Um, so let's start with how your journey fits into this picture and how you came to forming outcome. Uh, to be honest with you, when when the when the Lean Startup came out, and and I picked up the book, I was already reading Eric's uh, Eric's blog beforehand. But when I when I picked up the book, it basically it felt like he documented all the mistakes I, I made in my in in my previous startup. Uh, from top to bottom, it was a guide of um, what not to do. And I was resonating very well with it because I've done all those mistakes, um, starting from creating a business plan first and then starting development or putting eight months of development into a project that um, we haven't even bothered to ask any potential client about. All these mistakes were pretty much answered in, uh, in, the, in the Lean Startup for me. And um, as I was reading that, I was actually enrolled in an MBA program. And uh, I, I said, well, I want to explore the applicability of Lean Startup methodologies for existing products because it's, it's fine when you start from, from zero, right? When you start from scratch, you want to build something, methodology helps. But does it help when I have something already, you know, working in the market and then I want to, I don't know, add a feature, take out a feature, add a button, change the design, does that work? And uh, Funny enough, I found uh, I found for the alumni network of the of the school I was enrolled in, I found uh, somebody in Berlin that was willing to give me some some time and some space to explore that. One thing led to the other. I worked with startups. I worked with startups on the Berlin scene and then somewhere in the south of Germany. Um, and then at one point, I got headhunted by a large telecommunication company because it was by this time when larger organizations starting to see the benefit of, of using design thinking and, and lean startup in their product development approaches. And uh, they said, like, you know, we, we know what you're doing and um, on the uh, startup scene, we want you to come here and, and change our processes and, and everything. And uh, as I was with this company, um, I started documenting the things that I was putting in place in order to make lean startup work within, within a large organization setup. Because uh, it was one thing to apply it with a startup of two, three, five, ten, ten individuals, and it's another thing to apply it on a team of three, five, four, five, whatever, ten individuals within a large organization that's made up of a hundred thousand people. And um, those uh, those blog posts, those small tweets, um, got me in touch with my co-authors, and that's how we uh, we actually wrote the the corporate startup, the first book. So let's uh, let's turn to that book for for a minute. So in in the corporate startup, you address the need for organizations to build an innovation ecosystem. So can you tell us a, a bit about what you've learned 
uh, in, about the importance of seeing your organization as part of an ecosystem rather than its own island? Right. The the whole idea with, with ecosystem doesn't always reflect just how you view yourself as, you know, to, to, to quote you, Scott, uh, a monolithic organization, an island in the sun, but also how you view innovation within your organization. Because sometimes innovation within a large organization seems to be viewed as an island in the sun, a silo mm-hmm. in itself, and in, in, in most cases, not connected with anything else. Um, so we came, we came to this realizing that um, most organizations are excited about investing in innovation, are excited about doing innovation. However, the way they come to innovation, the way they apply, the way they make it happen is through single point solutions. We're going to build this one lab or we are going to partner with startups or we are going to develop a brilliant innovation strategy or uh, we are going to have an open innovation program with the local university without realizing that you don't need just that, but all the other things. You need to develop your leadership skills. You need to develop your middle managers. You need to develop capability within the organization. You need to change the processes. Then you need to have the lab. And then you need to have a venture capital arm. And then you need to partner with startups and work with universities, all those things. And those were things that we were, we were learning as, as we were going. This was 2012, 2013. And we were learning this as we were applying it in the, comp- in the companies we were, we were um, employed at. And uh, this, is, uh, this is, I think, the, the bedrock of, of the corporate startup. Essentially, how do you build a system that looks at everything, not just, not just a single point solution? And it doesn't, it doesn't look at innovation through the lens of one single thing that you do, one single silo, one single island, again, to quote you. But uh, you look at innovation being embedded in all the functions within the organization, in everything that the organization does, and to a wider extent, into the wider ecosystem the organization is playing in. Do you find that organizations are starting to adopt that, that mindset and strategy, or, or do you still find in your experience working with these organizations that the tendency still is to sort of hire your innovation team that sort of sits to the left of everything else and then sort of muddle through trying to adopt some of the ideas that they come up with? I think it's um, it really depends on the industry we're talking about, the degree of maturity that the particular company has, uh, the degree of experience the particular company has. I've seen a lot of organizations that have started with the idea of um, innovation being a, a silo that sits on the left or right mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Um, and now they realize that, hey, hey, actually, we don't have enough results to justify that investment. Let's embed innovation in all the departments. Or they realize that the lab has become a bottleneck for for the innovation efforts. Let's embed that in all departments. So it really depends. I mean, I think at the moment uh, we are at the level where we have front runners. We have organizations that have done this, have evolved a lot. They are highly mature. However, we also have beginner, beginner organizations. We have beginner organizations because some of them have actually started very late on the innovation journey. And some of them, to be honest with you, have just been complacent to change. They were really happy with just having the lab and call it innovation and not being bothered. What I'm currently seeing now post-COVID is that a lot of organizations that have done this, uh, this letter part, not wanting to evolve, um, are now dismantling their labs, dismantling their innovation function because they haven't seen any, any results. Hopefully, there's going to come uh, there's going to come a time for them when they're going to get a more visionary leadership or more committed to innovation leadership team, and they will um, rethink that approach and, as I said, increase their maturity. Mm-hmm. Because you know what what you're talking about there is leadership kind of almost trying to de-risk the uh, the task of innovation by putting it into a little bubble that you can kind of not not allow to 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 cause too much disruption. So, but that know, defies the, the purpose. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So the innovation framework being adopted by corporates that's being spun out of this lean startup movement can loosely be described as creating, testing, and scaling new ideas faster and with less risk than traditional new product development and R&D. So what, what are the biggest pitfalls that corporates find themselves falling into when they start to adopt this? Because on face value, it might seem quite straightforward, but it's very countercultural in many ways. What, what are you seeing? 
It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, we can, we can speak about this in probably five, six, seven, ten episodes of your podcast. Yeah, of course. I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 try, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep it very uh, top level and just address uh, only a handful. I think one of the biggest things that I have personally seen, and again, what I've seen is not a reflection of the entire world. I'm pretty, pretty aware of the fact that I've only worked with a handful of organizations, and there's probably a thousand times more out there. Um, what I've seen is that people tend to uh, confuse a couple of terms. They tend to confuse R&D with innovation on one hand for the organizations that are R&D heavy. Organizations in pharma, organizations in biotech, organizations in chemical, organizations in automotive. These are the things that come to mind. Uh, they tend to confuse R&D, and to a wider extent, talking about innovation, accounting, measuring innovation, they tend to confuse uh, R&D expenditure for a proxy for their innovation prowess. Uh, nothing further from the truth. Um, R&D is needed. You can't, you can't do innovation without R&D, but you can't just put an equal sign between, between R&D and innovation. Innovation requires that that particular thing that you just researched in the lab also has a, a viable business model, a market where it's selling at uh, a, a real market for which that thing solves a real problem. Um, and that's the tricky bit for most organizations, I would say. I think, I think mm. uh, organizations that are traditionally good with R&D um, have seen that they don't have an issue generating ideas. However, they have an issue commercializing those ideas. Um, Another thing, again, I just said they, they confuse innovation for another term that which is super hype at the moment, uh, digital transformation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of companies that I work with, and this, this, this works across the board, doesn't matter if you're a bank, if you're an airline, or if you are in whatever sports industry, um, people tend to confuse digital transformation with innovation because digital transformation implies something new. However, digital transformation in itself um, is only going to prevent your core business from getting outdated, from expiring. You're essentially using the same business model as before, the same processes as before. You're digitalizing them in an effort to become more efficient and keep up with times. What innovation is doing versus digital transformation is that the innovation is creating the future growth, the future core business. In digital transformation, you're just making sure that the core business of today doesn't die. With innovation, you're building the core business of tomorrow. And uh, again, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of leaders I'm, I'm working with. Just this morning, I had a call with somebody that said, hey, in my organization, people just take digital transformation for, for innovation. It's very difficult to convince them. Do you have a silver bullet for that? Well, actually, I don't. You just need to explain with them three examples that the things that they're investing in are not going to create any top line growth. Digital transformation only creates bottom line impact through efficiency improvement. With innovation, you are, if you're doing it right, creating top line growth. That's really interesting. I could see how the two would be easy to conflate, but how decidedly different they really are. You mentioned um, innovation accounting, so let's turn to to that to, to your book uh, for a moment. You make the point um, that we we can only measure innovation if we all agree what innovation is, which exactly from my from my experience isn't as easy as it sounds. So let's first get a, a working definition of innovation accounting, and then can we get some of your ideas around the different types of innovation and what they look like in practice? Right. Um, it's very important to define innovation in your organization because otherwise you might have people speaking about using the same word but speaking about different things um, and not just speaking but also investing in different things. And again, this goes back to what we just said earlier, the, the distinction between innovation and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to align on that definition. It's very important to align the definition of innovation at the very top of the organization. Because um, as the saying goes, the uh, bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. So it's very important to get a, uh, a definition, a line on the definition at the very top of the organization. Now, um, why is it important to define what innovation means for us? Because based on the definition, we might have different 
measures in place. Um, in, in the book, we're using the framework from Greg Sattel, uh, the four types of innovation. We, we found that framework to be super useful and super easy to understand. Essentially, <clears throat> you need to define what kind of innovation your organization does because if you're only interested in incremental um, um, innovation, and that's fine, that, that's how your, your, your industry works, that's how your company is set up, this is uh, what your investor expects from you, it's totally fine. But if you're just interested in incremental, you need to have <clears throat> different indicators for success than if you're doing disruptive innovation. <clears throat> totally different indicators because the type of innovation is different the skills that people need to use to do incremental are different than the skills that people need to have or, or tools they need to use to do the more disruptive mm-hmm. side of the, of the spectrum. Again, it's very important to define. And again, I don't think that organizations should necessarily pick and choose a type, but they need to pick and choose the type they want to primarily focus on. I'm not saying that focusing on one type excludes the existence of other types of innovation. I'm just saying that as an organization, you need to define what innovation means. And we are essentially going to invest most in this type of, inno- uh, this type of innovation and less in the other types. So having established what innovation means in your organization and many organizations, I think, are actually losing the term innovation, talking about growth to make that distinction because it, mm-hmm. it gets kind of confusing in people's minds. Growth is kind of, what, what kind of growth do you want? <laughs> do you want, do you want, yeah. Exactly, um, exactly. But and in your book, you provide a very comprehensive set of things that to build your um, innovation accounting system around. So can you take us through an example so we can build a picture of the approach that, that you're advocating? Right. We, um, again, through experience, we've realized another, uh, for the lack of better words, I'm going to call it a mistake that, uh, that large organizations um, usually make. And that's the fact that they want to synthesize innovation. They want to boil innovation down to one indicator. We want to measure everything we do innovation-wise with this single indicator to rule them all, much like Lord of the Rings. It doesn't work like that. Um, in, innovation is too complex. And again, the core business is too complex. So if we don't synthesize the core business down to one indicator, why would we do it for innovation? Because they're equally complex, I would say. Um, so in the book, we essentially propose a layered approach, if you want, to, to measuring innovation, starting from measuring teams, then measuring the funnel above them, and then measuring the overall um, corporate growth through innovation. The cool thing about it is that all these indicators are mutually supporting. Um, one, understanding one and measuring one will help you measure the one above and will help measure the one above that. So you can work upstream or downstream as you wish, depending if you are a, a, a coach or a member in the team or if you are an executive. If you are an executive, actually in the book, we have a nice table in chapter six where we say, okay, what is the problem you're trying to solve in your organization? I don't know. I'm not happy with my time to market. Perfect. If you're not happy with your time to market, you need to measure this particular indicator that it's, it's telling you what is your current time to market. And then in the book, you have arrows connecting that time to market with other indicators downstream, and you know exactly what you need to influence as, uh, as a leader. It's important to understand that as a leader, you can't influence results. You can only influence the process that leads people to certain results. It's like in football, right? A coach can't go on the pitch and play the game itself. He can just, you know, be on the bench and prepare the team in, in trainings. They can, they can discuss about strategy. They can discuss about training. They can discuss about nutrition, about everything that goes into winning a game. But he cannot go and score the goal. The team needs to do that. So if you're an executive and you're not happy with time to market, by, by following the connection between indicators, you understand what kind of influence you need to apply at team level, at product team level. Maybe they require some more coaching. Maybe you realize that a certain organizational design is not the right one in order to improve speed. It can be many things. So I'm imagining that when you are um, trying to get this idea of innovation accounting into an organization, you've got some existing um, 
habits and processes and mindsets around traditional accounting that might be at odds with this. Can you take us through what uh, shifts in mindset an organization needs to make to be able to embrace innovation accounting? Well, I think I think we need to take one step back and um, we need to discuss about something that, again, we've, we've spotted with many organizations. We've seen this um, whole debate between us versus them uh, when, when we talk about innovation teams and financial controllers or, or auditors. Um, we've seen these two groups, distinct groups, not liking each other. And one group thinking that they know it better than, than the other group. Um, I'm not advocating for either of the groups. I'm not saying that the financial controllers don't know anything about innovation or that innovation people don't know anything about um, finance or, or accounting. I'm just saying that, um, and this is our hope also in the book, to create a common language where these two sides can come together and start working together rather than working against each other. And uh, in order to do that, uh, obviously, the finance people or the, 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 the finance prone people need to learn how to how to innovate and need to understand, for example, the value of learning and need to understand the shortcomings of the financial system, um, such as, for example, and we have outlined in the beginning of the book, um, such as, for example, the fact that um, through standard accounting, financial accounting, uh, you can only measure the final outcome of the process. You cannot measure the process in itself, right? You only know hey, have we been profitable in the last quarter? Nothing to, you get no information with respect to the value creation system that led you to that particular result. Uh, and also the fact that through uh, the standard accounting system, the financial accounting system, you can't account for stuff that hasn't happened. And everybody that worked in innovation knows the value of learning. They understand that a hey, super important to do an experiment now super cheap. This week, we're going to build a landing page. We're going to track some traffic to that. And we're going to learn that nobody wants it rather than building a product and uh, launching it and then realizing nobody wants it. Uh, so they, they understand the value of doing small mistakes along the way that prevent you from doing a large mistake at the end. However, the financial accounting system doesn't account for that. In the financial accounting system, there is no place where you can write down learnings or write down stuff that you have preventing from happening. Um, and I think this is one of the, one of the things that, that the, um, the financial controllers, the auditors, the people that work in finance, the CFO needs to, uh, needs to understand. At the same time, the folks in innovation need to be less romantic about innovation. They need to understand the fact that they are part of a team and the team needs to win. Um, and they need to understand that innovation needs to drive growth. If there is no clear uh, connection between the growth of a company and their effort as an innovator, they run the risk of being deprioritized and the lab being killed and they're losing their jobs in the next quarter. And again, we've seen that with, with organizations that haven't seen any results before Corona. The first thing the CFOs did, and I salute them for doing that, they closed down the innovation labs. They closed down the innovation functions. Why? Because guys, you had five years. You haven't shown me one piece of product that has improved my, my top line growth. Why should I keep you? Why should I keep you? We're, we're trying to survive here. You're going to be the first one to get slashed. So again, the innovators should be less romantic about what they do. They should stop fantasizing that they are Elon Musk. They should stop fantasizing that they are Mark Zuckerberg and they are reinventing the wheel and they are surrounded by idiots. And uh, they should be pragmatic. Is my project going to drive growth? Stop talking about hearts and minds. Stop talking about, yes, but we're experimenting with, we're experimenting with cool technologies. Stop talking about all this nonsense and show me that, I'm not saying next quarter, I'm not saying end of next year, but show me there is potential for actual growth resulting from the ideas or the idea that we're working uh, that you're working on so what you're what you're, what you're pointing at then i think is that both sides need to find common ground around an investment mind, an investment mindset so they're both thinking about investment for growth as opposed to investment to play <laughs> or money to play versus yep. you know being a you know a, a a controller if you like and and trying to stop the organization from wasting money 
Um, that's the kind of s- dynamic that you see in a lot of these kind of situations. So if both can yeah. ad- adopt this common language and common ground. What, what, what do you think is the most um, useful starting point to establish that common ground between finance and, and, and innovation teams? In my opinion, the organization should uh, come together around a common framework for innovation, a common product life cycle. That for me is a prerequisite for doing innovation accounting and for having people communicate or, or, or discuss together around, uh, around a certain idea or around a certain business model. They, the organizations should have a very clear product life cycle. These are the stages ideas have to pass through from the moment we create them to the moment they are sustainable and driving growth for, for our company. In the absence of that, uh, financial controllers are going to push for, show me the numbers, and they are right to do so. However, if they have a very strong voice within the organization, it will mean that the organization will only invest in incremental innovation. And on the other side, if the innovation guys will have, uh, will have, uh, their, will have their say and will have it their way within the organization, uh, the organization will probably just invest in buying the sky type of projects, uh, flying cars, lightsabers and stuff that you don't know if they're going to be successful. They might be, but um, we we don't know if they're going to be successful in the next 5, 10, 15 years, maybe. So this is why it's important to have a, a product lifecycle framework we all agree upon and we understand what are the steps that idea have to ha- have to go through from the moment we create them to the moment they are in the market. This is going to alleviate a lot of frustrations. This is going to alleviate a lot of uh, anxiety from the from the financial side, right? Now I know what, where are most of my ideas, stage wise, maturity wise, and I know how long I need to wait before I'm going to see impact. And also, the innovators will know that hey, I need to start moving this faster to market because the finance the finance people are looking at this as well. So I like what you're saying. This notion of pragmatism as a way to put in check any over romanticized ideas about innovation. Yeah. I also really like that there are big ideas being sought after, right? Like the, you know, the fact that I can, you know, get anything delivered to my house at, at, with the push of a button, you know, overnight or sooner is, is a result of some really romanticized ideas about what's possible. Sure. So I, I wonder if we can stay with this tension for a minute and, people that are tasked with or just naturally prone to sort of a big picture, you know, large innovation thinking, Mm -hmm. how do they take forward those ideas in very pragmatic ways so that it's not over romanticized? Um, I think for the people that are working on this so-called moonshot projects, um, and again, I think every organization, I'm encouraging every organization to have at least a couple of those, um, because you don't know the direction in which an industry is heading, where if you want to shape a certain industry, by all means, you need a moonshot project. Um, for the people that are on these moonshot projects, the ones that are in charge, coaches, team members, you need to have a story to tell. At the end of, at the end of every month, at the end of every week, you need to have a story to tell. Uh, and a very pragmatic story, that is. Mm. Meaning that you need, to, you need to explain to people why this week was a good week for your project. What have you done concretely? What have you learned? What was the direction in which you were going? What have you learned about a certain technology you were thinking about developing or acquiring? Maybe a certain thing that you've learned is pushing the whole idea in a different, in a different direction. Mm. Right. So it's very important for the people that work there to have a very clear story for why they exist and why should people continue backing them. In the absence of that story and in the absence of, again, pragmatism, um, people that are more skeptical about, about this Moonshot project will find 101 reasons to discontinue the project. And it's going to be very easy to do it. it it's, it's, it's way easier to justify why I want to discontinue this than it is to find reasons why this, this should exist. Mm-hmm. And um, to mitigate against that, try to have constant, constant contact with decision makers with with stakeholders in that project even if you like them or you don't or you don't like them as individuals you still need to have that constant contact with them and try to build a nice narrative 
try to build a nice narrative to why the project is important and try to build a nice narrative around your actions within that project. I've done this particular experiment, I learned this, or I'm waiting for a certain supplier to deliver this particular material because this material is going to tell us if the whole thing can actually exist as a whole or we need to ex experiment with a different direction or expand in a different direction. Here on The Evolving Leader, we are committed to stretching the leadership conversation in every episode, and we invite you to help spread the word. If you have learned or been inspired by something you heard on this podcast, chances are others would too. Please consider sharing your favorite episode with your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. Thanks for listening. So you, you talked about an example of an organization that doesn't have a problem with generating new ideas. Of you know, a pharma company, for example, it's got a very successful R and D department. There's lots of problems to go after. You know, and they're out in the public domain as well because they're very visible. <clears throat> what about the organizations that have um, had previous success but are stagnating, and um, primarily because there aren't any ideas in the organization. There aren't creative people. They haven't hired them. They've hired operational people to exploit the the success of the past. And they're now running out of ideas. How do you get an organization that's a bit immune to creativity and imagination to start valuing that from an uh, innovation accounting perspective? Right. Um, from an innovation accounting perspective, I would usually make the case around a couple of indicators I'm, I'm very fond of. Um, the first one that comes to mind is NPVI, New Product Vitality Index. So if you're an organization that has a reluctant leadership team, reluctant from an innovation perspective, reluctant to invest, reluctant to, to fund innovation, reluctant to, to explore new growth avenues, I will always challenge those people and make them look at their New Product Vitality Index. New Product Vitality Index means in percentages, uh, how much of our current revenue comes from products we've launched in the past three, five years. And that's when, they real, that's when they will realize that, hey, we actually don't have that much new revenue coming from new ideas. And by new ideas, I really mean new ideas. If you are listening to this podcast and you work in Daimler and people claim that the new A class is a new idea, I would totally challenge that. <laughs> Yeah. Right. It's 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 an iteration of the old A class, which is an iteration of the generation before, which is an iteration of the generation before that. So the new generation of A class is nothing new. Um, however, if you are listening to this in Daimler and you're looking at the revenue that comes from the new EQ models, that definitely counts as new revenue because it's a it's a totally different car. Now it's full electric. It has a different a different setup than all the other cars you've done. That should go into the NPVI calculation. The other one would be around the portfolio distribution. So essentially, how many of your current bets and how many of your current business models are core, how many adjacent, how many transformational? Uh, this portfolio di distribution is going to paint a very clear picture of you with respect to the risk of disruption. If everything is core and you're only investing in core initiatives, don't be surprised if you are going to get disrupted in 5, 10, 20 years. Again, it all depends on the industry you are, you are in, your company is in. Some industries are more prone to disruption than others. So there are a lot of folks listening to you right now who aren't formally in an innovation role, but I can't think of a single industry in today's world where innovation isn't essential to the long-term mission and sustainability of that organization's place in their market. So... In my view, um, you know, everyone has a role in that process, in that innovation of the organization, an opportunity to ideate, create, challenge, status quo, make recommendations, all the things that can unlock real value for the future. So what is, you know, a, one piece of advice that you could leave with our listeners that is pertinent to everyone, regardless of the role that they play in their organization? I would say that innovation is everyone's job in my opinion at least uh however some people might have it higher on their job descriptions some people might have it lower um the advice i would give to everyone is to be curious uh, be curious about the work that's in front of you 
regardless if you are listening to this podcast and you are head of innovation or you're listening to this and you are head of compliance or vendor acquisition. Mm. Uh, be curious and try to approach everything with a, with a curious mindset. Try to look at everything um, from the eyes of somebody that is seeing this for the first time because that's where the heart of the innovation is. That's where most innovations start. When we look things for when we look at things that we've seen for many times before, but we look through the lens of somebody that's seeing it for the first time. So mm-hmm. be curious would be my my advice. And also be humble. Advice. But curiousness and humbleness, they go together. Mm. I like that. And and uh, as a curious person, you know, obviously you've just uh, crossed the line of the efforts of writing a new book so maybe maybe you're not on this at the moment but i'm just i'm interested to know what what's next for you what are you working on now what's your next horizon of uh, endeavor on innovation right um i think that at the moment we're we're doing our best to establish the concept of innovation accounting uh establish it in terms of having more companies adopt the idea because we wrote the book seeing that this is a big problem uh, people don't measure innovation. So now we're, we're helping large organizations become more professional about measuring innovation, uh, working with organizations that are mature, meaning that they have been on the, on the innovation path. To Scott's point earlier in the, in the conversation, more, more mature organizations. Um, and to, to that, uh, to, on that front, we are trying to put together a, a software tool that's going to help the in the adoption of innovation accounting because innovation accounting to some extent requires a lot of reporting from the product teams and the product teams don't want to report because they're busy you know talking with clients doing experiments building their building their product essentially right because no amount of reporting is going to move the needle on the profitability of your organization However, you also need to do reporting because people need to know what's going on. So we're trying to reduce the friction uh, and reduce the amount of interactions required to report on, uh, on innovation through a very simple, I, I hope, to software tool. But uh, we'll, we'll see when it comes out how, how simple and, and how easy it is to use. And if an organization uh, adopts innovation accounting, what's... What looks different? What, what's happening in the organization that's not happening today? Um, I think there's going to be more accountability. I'm not, I think, I know from the organizations that have adopted it. Uh, there is more accountability uh, throughout the entire hierarchy, not just the product team level, but also at, at middle management, at, at, at top leadership. There's going to be more and more accountability. And uh, there's going to be more transparency. Uh, we're going to know, for example, Every single dollar of revenue we've spent on innovation, how many dollars did it bring us back three years from now in, in, new, in new revenue? So I think that the accountability and transparency are the first thing you are going to see. Plus, again, I hope for, for pragmatism. I hope that people are going to become more pragmatic about investment and less romantic about innovation. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about COVID and how the last... 20 months has affected innovation in organizations and what shifts you've seen there? Again, the silver lining of the whole COVID thing, and again, I highlight silver lining, um, is the fact that it forced leaders to take a more pragmatic stance on innovation. Um, It forced leaders to think hard about their investments, and it forced some leaders to understand that innovation is no longer a nice to have, that you need to have it. it you cannot survive. It was very funny at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, visual capitalists put out the research of one of their, you know, like infographics, whatever they're called, showing the uh, market cap of Zoom. And at that point, the market cap of Zoom was uh, equal to the market cap of all the U.S.-based airlines combined. <laughs> wow. And uh, again, I'm not saying that 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 American or or Lufthansa or KLM should have invested in Zoom or should have created their own Zoom equivalent. Uh, but I'm sure there were smaller innovations they could have done uh, that 
in, in, in an event of their core business going bust as it went for six months, they would have their, and that particular thing will be able to at least generate some revenue for, for the organization. So I think this, is, this was the silver lining. People realizing they need to be pragmatic about, about their investment in innovation. And second, people realizing that innovation is no longer a nice to have, but a must have. And also the fact that digital transformation should be sitting very high on the agenda. Very, very high. And next to it, probably, probably innovation. Well, Dan, you've said it all. Uh, well, not all, because we have so many different things we could cover, but but we're certainly so much better for what you have shared with us today. So so thank you very much uh, for coming on and, and sharing your insights with us. Lots to lots to take away from this. Yeah, and I just want to add, I, I, um, I you know, read your book um, over the last week, and a couple of things struck me. One is it's beautifully written and presented. It's a lovely looking book, and uh, you obviously put a, a lot. You and your co-author put a lot of love into it but i would definitely recommend it as a uh, a read mm-hmm. for all of those aspiring uh, innovation leaders out there and and their finance partners as well um because mm-hmm. i think it, it would be a great um common space to be able to share and and to build a, a new type of relationship so i thoroughly recommend yeah. it thank you thank you very much for having me on the show and thank you very much for the kind words well, you're welcome, and uh, good luck with uh, good luck with uh, promoting innovation accounting in the world. All right, everybody, make sure to pick up a copy of Dan's new book today. And remember, until next time, the world is evolving. Are you?